Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in um, to this philosophical friendship, or uh, not, not friendship, well, that too, fellowship. I believe this is the third or fourth one that I've had on my channel. Um, and I have to say that this one was really special. I felt it was really special. And I'm curious to hear what you feel about it. Um, especially that part of what seems so possible, right? And just being a human being, but every, like, a, like in, in being with one another, really dwelling together in true, true skole, or there's definitely many moments where I could viscerally feel the apex of 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 the ideal and and the process of becoming like this one in the same thing very renewing so much being realizing the being in in the moment with each other as this feels like that this this conversation really in many moments realized and evoked and invoked so thank you for joining me um some housekeeping john verveke and i are having a are going to be teaching a course on dialogos and circling bringing together bringing together the you could say the deep intimacy that that circling practices and the and philosophical dialectic into a into an actual into a uh, an experiential practice so there's a uh, there's a question and answer video about it um, uh, on my channel here and also a uh, an announcement video about it which is really good um, and it it is July, I believe it's July 24th and 25th, from 10 a.m. until 4. Um, if you're interested, the link for that is below. You, uh, you, uh, you sign up uh, through a, um, over Facebook. We have a Facebook invite, and that has all the details on it. Okay. Also... If you are interested also in exploring or diving deeper in circling, along with many other things that we do, the weekend after the Dialogos course, we have a, um, a circling intensive, which is 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, California time, Saturday and Sunday. And that is a very, 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 very deep, deep dive being facilitated at every moment, right, by trained by the people who who, who have who have training and have have mastery in circling, um, and really going deep in in the practice. And there's so much that's possible in terms of intimacy, both with people, but in a way that reveals something that transcends people, right. So please come. Links for everything's below. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, go ahead and email me, and um, I'll uh, get back in touch with you, and we can cover cost, and we can talk about that more. And my email's below. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Okay. Welcome everybody. Welcome to all the people who are are listening to this. So I just want to say a couple of words about um, the practice that we'll be doing and uh, set some context for that. And then we'll go be going into um, a reading by Boober and then we'll be going into the actual practice of it. So 
I think what brings a lot of us together, right, is a shared, like whether or not we knew, I would imagine whether or not we were like, like propositionally present to or said it to ourselves or not. I think that a lot of a lot of us have come together with a shared interest in um, the philosophical, but not just as doctrines or 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 knowledge per se, but but that there's something in in the work of philosophy or philosophia um, is is a kind of can be a kind of knowing through being transformed in the process of knowing, right? Knowing through transformation, right? A, um, a real participatory, relational, warm, embodied, embedded, um, living thing that is actually, I think that we probably all experience and why we, really why we, we, we come together and are interested in the philosophical um, in the first place is that there's something deeply human about it, right? And transformative about it. And so in this practice really, I think circles around that and highlights that part of it. So this, this is about really engaging into um, becoming in some sense and speaking from what is being written by Buber, the work that we're doing. So everything we're gonna be doing is about like being in some sense in some sense, um, speaking, listening, um, sharing from it, right? From what we're doing. And so we'll be going in progressive layers. I'll start with, what, 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 um, we'll, we'll, we'll all start with like a, like a five minute silent meditation. Then we'll move into um, a, I'll, I'll go into a share, like a slow reading of, of a longer text by Buber. Then I'll take a quote from Buber that basically summarizes what I just read. And then we'll take turns saying it, sounding it out together in, in, in order for, we'll do that for about five, 10 minutes. Then we'll be going into um, evoking the experience, speaking from, right? Not unpacking what, what we think about it or what it says verbally, but rather um, sharing a phrase of, in a certain sense, speaking as it and from it, presencing and being presenced by it, right? And in that, in that way, we're not, we're not responding to each other at, at that phase. Then the next phase is where we start to jazz a bit, right? Where, again, we're not, we're not necessarily breaking things down and analyzing anything, um, but we're more, again, evoking the perspective that this that the, that the thing is evoking, and basically, like maybe a sentence or two sentences, but we're open to being affected and responded to each other, responding to each other. And then the last part is where we go into like regular dialogue, and and when we go into regular dialogue, what we want to just become present to is notice how the how the non-propositional, how the 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 participatory relational, you could say, space that we're all humming in at that point, right, um, is present, is present in, in the dialogue, right? So, it, you know, keeping that spirit and being awake to that. Sound good? All right. So just a little, I wanna, I wanna just talk a little bit about Boober. So I'm doing right now. I'm doing a um, uh, a trialogue that comes out next Thursday, the first one. Well, I think we're going to be doing a six part trialogue with with John and and Zevi um, on rationality, um, uh, mysticism, and and the dialogical, and 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 and, and using um, Steel Manning Buber, right, as a jumping off point. And so I've been I I've been kind of dwelling in Buber here lately, because um, that's my my roughly speaking that's the kind of the that's the uh, I, I'm going to be the dialogical part right because um, that's a lot of the work in, in essence that 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 we practice in circling and which is something I've been doing for the last twenty five years or so, and so I've been 
um, I've been reading Buber, I've been reading I and Thou, I've been reading other people who have responded and critiqued Buber and kind of getting familiar with the, with the issues around Buber between you know, Heidegger and Buber and the whole world of Buber. And it's really interesting because I have to say that like more than, more than ever, and I've, I've read Buber quite a bit, like he's, he's, we read I and Thou in our, in our um, year long training. Um, so it's something I'm really familiar with, but somehow this round of it, right. And getting prepared for this, this time, I really noticed that it just seems to me that a boober is all about, um, speaking from what he's speaking about. He's in some sense, he's in that Socratic way. Um, he's speaking to something that's very difficult to put into words, if even possible to put into words, and that he's constantly, in one sense, writing and responding um, by being what he's writing and responding to. And in, in, a, and in some sense, that's, I've always got that about Buber, but this time I'm really seeing that big time. And so I really see the Socratic spirit in him, right? That, that even, even when people critique his work, his response to their critique is inadequate in just the right way that, ex that exemplifies the response that they're critiquing him about, right? Like you can just feel that sense in which he will not attempt to, in some sense, reduce something down in like desacralize de something, right? For the sake of some kind of something that goes against what the knowledge is really evoking and standing for. And so you can all, you can just in that, in that explanation, you can, you, you know, at least my estimation of that, you can hear his emphasis on modes, on a mode of a place to come from and where he is most popular, right? Where he's most known, is for his work on what he calls I Thou and the mode of I Thou. And what that is, right, he, he, in the way he gets at that in, in the book I Thou is through pairing, showing, basically saying that like, look, all of life, all of, of existence is relational, right? Everywhere you look, it's a relational. There's no thing that then relates. There is just modes of relation. And, and he says, for human life, we are, we are, he summarizes that you can see it, see it as we are in one or two basic relations. We are either in an I thou relation or an I it. And you get a feel for this. He says like the I thou happens in time and space. The I it happens in neither, right? There's a, there's a, and he kind of pairs these two. And it, as, as he does, he starts to evoke this, this thing about where he says the, the, the encounter with the, uh, with the I thou that can only be spoken as one word, right? That's the important part, right? Is that there's no eyes walking around out there and thou's that then meet each other. That there's a, the I thou is spoken as one word, right? It's a fundamental modal knowing, relating, encounter of immediacy. And he says it ultimately, and he was a religious thinker as well. Um, it, it, it's, many people talk about Buber as bringing, bringing God back into the secular, right? A lot of people like, see him that way. He's a, in that sense, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a true existentialist. Um, and sees that it is in the encounter with the other or with the thou that is the most real encounters of our lives, right? And then oftentimes what we take as the most real is our something like the end product of that that ends up being kind of like the after image of the retina of the eye, we call that real, right? And uh, uh, that, that, that the, the real in itself is really for human beings, right? It comes in the encounter in, in the thou. So that's the sense of, of in, and in that sense, I, have a, I hear in Buber a real, a real deep 
hearing and a response to um, the numb that the part of nihilism of modernity that that's numbing, right? The the part that like ab over abstracts and objectifies everything, and so you can kind of hear him in some sense like in response to that to that kind of numbing, and and being addressed by it and addressing it, right? You can kind of hear he's really he's, to me he's really sensitive to that, right? Okay, so now I will go through the slow reading. Well, actually, let's go. Let's actually first let's do the mindfulness first, and I'll I'll go ahead and pause the recording. Okay, here is a piece, and I'll do the slow reading, and I'll I'll read it slowly in a couple of times. And this is from Martin Buber's I and Thou. The encounter with God does not come to man in order that he may henceforth attend to God, but in order that he may prove its meaning in action in the world. All revelation is a calling and a mission. But again and again, man shuns actualization and bends back towards the revealer. He would rather attend to God than to the world. Now that he has bent back, however, he is no longer confronted by a thou. He can do nothing but place a divine it in the realm of things, believing that he knows about God as an it and talk about him. Even as the enigmatic, does not live anything directly, whether it be a perception or an affection, but reflects on his perceiving or affection or affectionate. I and thus I and thus misses the truth of the process. Thus, the theomanic, who incidentally can get along with get along very well with the ego maniac in the very same soul will not let the gift take full effect, but reflects instead on what on that, which gives and misses both gift take full effect, but reflects instead on that, which gives and misses both. When you are sent forth, God remains present, remains presence for you. Whoever walk in his mission always has God before him. The more faithful the fulfillment, the stronger and more constant the nearness. Of course, he cannot attend to God, but he converse, can converse with him. Bending back, on the other hand, turns God into an object. It appears to be a tuning towards the primal ground, but belongs in the truth to the world movement of turning away, even as the apparent turning away of those who fulfill their mission belongs in truth to the world movement of turning towards. I'll read that one more time. The encounter with God does not come to man in order that he may henceforth attend to God, but in order that he may prove its meaning in the action in the world. All revelation is a calling and a mission. But again and again, man shuns actualization 
actualization and bends back toward the revealer. He would rather attend to God than the world. Now that he has bent back, however, he is no longer confronted by a thou. He can do nothing but place a divine it in the realm of things. Believe that he knows about God as an it and talk about him. Even as the egomaniac does not, does not live anything directly, whether it be a perception or an affection, but reflects on his perceiving or, or affectionate, reflects on his perceiving or affectionate. And, and I thus miss the truth of the process. Thus, the, the egomaniac who incidentally can get along very well with the ego, egomaniac in the same name, in the very same soul, will not let the gift take full effect, but reflects instead on that which gives and misses both. Gift take full effect, but reflects instead on that which gives and misses both. When you are set forth, God remains presence for you. Whoever walks in his mission always has God before him. The more faithful the fulfillment, the stronger and more constant the nearness. Of course, he cannot attend to God, but, can, but he can converse with him. Bending back, on the other hand, turns God into an object. It appears to be a turning towards the primal ground, but belongs in truth to the world movement of turning away, even as the apparent turning away of those who fulfill their mission belong in truth to the world of movement of turning towards. Okay. And I will go first then Daniel, then Fiverr, then Thomas, then Rose. And here is a quote. I actually did not pull this from the thing that I just read, but it summarizes. Well, we'll see. And I'll go first. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. 
when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically 
and humanly. God is the electricity that, that surges between them. The two people relate to each other authentically and humanly. God is the electricity surges between them. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. Okay. So everyone just take a deep breath. So now we are going to move into um, the next part of this. And we'll start by going in, in the same order that we went. And then we'll open up to have it be spontaneous um, with no particular order. And this, just to remind us, is to evoke and invoke. It's to speak out in small amount of words. Like it's speaking as little and saying as much as possible. I'll go first. Uber is urging. It's urging to notice. Noticing little sparks between me and you. Noticing the silence in which something is asking to be born. Our sayings, our, our sailings from shores to shores. Reminding ourselves again what made us alive. Authentically as naked to what already is the case emerging as one revelation of that which is revealed. Just, <clears throat> just being present to that which presence is. Surrendering to what, to what will be born. Responding to that which affords a re betrothal. The one is two or not one. Turning toward thou, I. Am naked, thou is naked. God is dressed and undressing both of us. Mm. 
Now we will, no particular order, we'll just open it up in the same mode. The between is where it all happens. Listening to the stillness that affords us all. We are, we are the in between, we are the in between. We belong in the in between. Towarding together to the domain where the thunderbolt links. The other makes nothing a space to stretch. There you are. There you are, unclothed of my forgetting. Nothing on me can be a mirror. Guy, Fiverr, Daniel, Thomas. Belonging together, unconcealed. Uh, connected solitude small worlds sink large worlds float how rare the attempt to share world You always outlive my conception of you. Is, is the world now worlding in and through God? A world of one person would be a spot. What? Uh... What is this ring that holds us together? What, what would like to be born? Already always the case. Lightning ceases for free saying in the holding of being as the relevance of the is for right now. 
electricity without a connection shocks instead of powers. The electricity is the still point. The I, thou, gathers the recognition of gathering. Without you, I could not be thou. The very technological architecture to even afford this gathering is perhaps in some way to an attempt, an incarnation of the kind of God for the kind of connecting that we're attempting to respond to and speak to with and through each other, which is a very strange time to be hyperlinked as humans right now. Okay, now we'll move into um, being able to respond to one another, right? And uh, it's still in the same sense of evoking and invoking. In no particular order, spontaneous. There's sort of an absence of, a curious absence of the doubt that besieges me. It takes trust to let go of my sacred object. When five people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. The, the surge holds me and nourishes me. There's no God who didn't make us. And I pray. I don't know who's talking to who. There's a there's a quiet joy. I feel embraced in every word of your sayings. I don't know about you all, and I don't know why I enjoy the, at times, almost the unendurable electricity that 
then inspires you know philo- philosophical saying that there's something about that it's painful but it's such a joyous just the, the something about that the responding to the way in which the electricity seizes you to then put forth I love it when listening to thou tutors the listener. I never think I'm not listening. Now, what Thomas on that electricity reminds me when you go to if you go to write something or a creative work and then boom, there's something kind of there. And, you know, there are so many artists that that's, you know, they wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm present to that, that, that uh, modal sweet spot. Mm-hmm. That begs of no complacency. <laughs> and as the artist you you feel vulnerable to give your work to other people there's something about discussing god where it's like you're giving god uh who god is to you to others and what could happen and so i think that's where the, there's the temptation boober says to just gnostically project it away i'm loving the idea that I can't not I can't not God it's like there's a a possibility in in the circle. What is it? Hearing you say the possibility had me realize I was already in relationship to that which you said. the saying of which by you brought it into articulation at the same time. Cool. Makes me think that there's almost a temptation to think that there's nothing going on between people when there always is. So the importance of not giving in to the temptation to think that there's nothing going on. The is in your last statement tickles, tickles me right now. There's something that's holding me up. I no longer have to do it all myself. Is Ah. that God? Ah. Or is that you? Sitting just behind my eyes as I look for you walking in circles. And then I look at other, I look at you, and I recognize something. Is it just a shared dizziness? How tragic we associate holding up with holding back. 
how tragic we associate holding up with holding back. That's holding us back. Paradox. Womb of paradox, holding of paradox, loving paradox, even joy. The, tem the temptation to worship God in a way that has nothing to do with us. And the negation of the negation. Realizing I'm not listening <laughs> is the beginning, is the beginning of listening. bubble pop. Okay. Now we can just move into dialogue. I'm, <clears throat> I'm just seized by this surging no thing, but it is beyond my what I can articulate what I can make intelligible but I am in in wonder by just by the this this profound heat and and energy that's just flowing through this space in this possibility that we are dwelling inside and i just want to say um thank you that we have been able to open up and dwell together in this space that gratitude shared that experience Daniel is describing is the answer to the meaning crisis. Is there a, a gathering of, uh, of energy? It's the still point where everything is moving where there's a concentration that is the dance. Yeah. Elliot starts proof rock. He has a line where he says to take the universe and to roll it up into a ball, an infinite question that you flick away. But then when he gets to the four quartet, the ball is a still point at which the dance of all things commences, that movement. Mm -hmm. And Eliot himself kind of embodies a life that moves from a wasteland that he later calls a rhythmic rumbling to a place at the still point where the fire and the rose is one and neither is consumed in that paradoxical space where the layers of time overlay. So getting there, feeling that, not just knowing it, is when we talk about this meaning crisis, that's it, to feel it, to know it. Classically, knowing is not known until it is experienced like Daniel is describing. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. Being being held by the ever living fire, the arche, but not being consumed by it, mm -hmm. but being nourished by it, and just just being 
grateful for the sheer gracefulness that comes from the ever living fire. Mm. A rose, if I want to get to its center and I peel off every petal and I get to the last two petals. Fuck. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it, it went away. This, this sense of there is this way where Boober, I think, is beckoning us to notice that this relation, right? with both reveals and conceals the center. And the center needs the particular and the particular reveal and conceal the center and that still spot, right? Blossoms or can blossom. And there's a way in which that sense of two roses by thou, right, recognizing the center has, all, has already been and the particular uniqueness of that other is something, there's something about how peculiar for me, like I've yet to meet anybody where I've really, really listened in and everyone is so, is so strange, like so <laughs> particular right? So particular. I've not yet met anyone where I've like really listened and haven't, that hasn't been the case. Yet there's something about the, that knowing felt sense of getting that is this moment of meeting, right? Um, the, Catholic theologian, Peter Kreeft, he has this part where he says, you know, we have this idea, you know, Christians have the idea when they go to heaven, they become like neutered angels. But really, it's more like you become more particular, you become more like Athena and Apollo, and Apollo more these greater and more particular and fascinating beings. And he says, you know, a lot of people think, won't you get bored in heaven? But people are infinitely interesting. And in heaven, each individual, the extraordinariness of their particularity is brought to the forefront. So you can easily spend an eternity with a single person person, let alone all of the billions through, through creation. And that notion of heaven as a bringing out of particularity, not a neutering per se, of an increase of libido and different things is, is, is critical. And then also what he discusses is that when the world is more world, when the world is more itself, very similar to Buber here, like when we're looking to the world, um, the, the, it's very interesting in the New Testament, it does not say that God is where two or more angels are gathered. It doesn't say, you know, it's where two or more people are gathered, that then the Holy Spirit is alive. Fellowship. Yes. The belonging, the, the, the holding, the holding... The holding that affords the letting go it's like uh, all the false identities fall away <laughs> all our feathers <laughs> hey, there is no need for them they're superfluous when when we find that electricity unconnected so much becomes superfluous Hmm. Hmm. The, the burdens of God are always light. They're not heavy and they illuminate. Mm -hmm. 
if only we may have to die to ourselves as a language, our status and fame and acting, but the burden is light, it is not heavy and it illuminates. There's a sense of having to hold something, hold what has been created very carefully. So to care for it. I felt as you were as you were speaking that you were um, you were instructing in my imagination to imagine this careful, delicate, like um, a reverential holding of what is so delicate. And at every moment as I did that, it all animated and filled me with care. I was like, ah. Ah, it's very, it's very delicacy called forth a care that filled me up with a care for it, yet I feel cared by it in that relation. Exactly. Is this heat that seems to rise or flare up both from within me and without me through this space that we have created and opened up together? Is this the revelation of the divine agape that has been there forever but that we fail to notice too often yeah. the great go on go, go. no no that's good the uh tragedy in the west um where christianity is very influential is that the word God comes to mean a singular being, but in Christianity, God is a trinity, which means that God is multiple people, but one essence. And the language is that God is therefore a dance, a that are one in the dance, and that God is essentially love because there are multiple persons in God, even if they're one essence. That seems like a crazy paradox, but what we're doing right here, you can see actually when you practice it, it's not a par it's it doesn't contradict, it's a paradox, but it doesn't negate, it's very possible. And what you're seeking in these fellowships is a sort of multiple people, one essence, which again, to say that that is God is only crazy if you think of God as a single being. But if you think of God as a trinity, to use that language of multiple people with a single essence, it makes perfect sense. When two people Can relate to each other authentically and humanly, yeah. God is the electricity that surges between them. The only time God can walk about humans and not kill them in the Bible is when they are naked in the garden. <laughs> can I read a, a short passage from Nishitani's book? Mm. Empty, because it really ties into what, what O.G. Rose just said. Emptiness is the field on which an essential encounter can take place between entities normally taken to be the most distantly related, even at enmity with each other, no less than between those that are most closely related. This encounter is called essential because it takes place at the source of existence common to the one and the other, and yet 
the point where each is truly itself. It is here that all things can encounter one another on a level of equality beyond distinctions of gratitude and revenge, free of differences between ill will and good. Mm. Indeed, it is even inadequate to speak any longer of an encounter, just as a single beam of white light breaks up into rays of various colors when it passes through a prism. So we have here an absolute self-identity in which the one and the other are yet truly themselves and at once absolutely broken apart and absolutely joined together. They are an absolute two and at the same time an absolute one. In the words of the Zen master Daito Kokushi, separated from one another by a hundred million kalpas, yet not apart a single moment, mm. sitting face to face all day long, yet not opposed for an instant. Scully. This is Scully. I speak on reifying. I'm I'm enjoying and and um, I want to I want to point to it. I want to point to it um, and let it be the what is free right now in this relation in this con this this conversation there's something that is affording a non um so many of the normativities of speaking together and i'm enjoying the islands of um what occurred to me, or, that, or is there something going on where we're fract it's like fractals of, but without it, there's, I think what I'll put it more precisely, there's the, there's a particular freedom from um, a demand for linear coherence, narrative lining up, there's some, there's some kind of freedom here. There's something that's not here and there's something that's here. And it's, I, I wanna point to it and let it be. That, that resonates uh, very deeply with the, what's been playing in my mind since you know, throughout all of your listening, but there's something about the the necessity for the awareness of this kind of practicing to not only move towards something, to be, but to be a warder, to be a safeguarder, to be on this wayward stewarding, like warding the establishing of the stillness for the domain, for the lightning linking, and then in our human, and then just in our, in our, in our, temporal meeting together like this eternally enacting the thing that is the inceptionalizing of world and persons in world as the thing that the human being independent of the way in which it is historically articulated or historically transformed but the affordance for that kind of free gathering for free saying in order to actually have the kind of sharing of world for new persons in that world in order to speak from deeper places to deeper resources within you. And then it's like in that free domain for that kind of free saying and the establishing of that, then it's like the reality of moving toward in order to ward it and to, to, to protect it as the place for like where we can actually dwell more wisely, not as in a characteristic achievement of my being wise or your being wise, but now the very way in which together our transjective, co-creative, bi-directional coupling 
of ourselves to our worlds together as it is more disclosed for that simultaneity of presence, then it's like that in the sharing of that freely and philosophically, then it's like you can actually dwell in a wise domain together where it's not, it, 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 it's just like this, this wonderful kind of like, um, this like simultaneous dethronement of any just inadequate dichotomies to have this just the shared transjectivity of the doing of the presencing. And then it's just like something like inhabiting a wiser way of being here takes place. And that, that, that really has a lot to do with just something about that relationship between like sageliness and concealment. And then, just so much of that playing. Hmm. Well, uh, there's a permission to stumble. Uh, if you yeah. it's kind of have an image of a baby bird, it kind of stumbles and then it can take flight. If it's not allowed to stumble, it, it never flies. And I think it, uh, I have this image too of the parent that lets their child on a bicycle fall uh, you know, they can fall and then get hurt, but we're kind of taught to never speak with other people unless we have finished products. You know, you don't go ride your bike in public or with others until you know how to do it. You don't, uh, you don't go in front of others until you can fly. But of course, if you're never allowed, there are certain places and skills and what have you, you can only reach with others. But if you can't stumble with them, if you can't learn the bike, then you'll never get there. And the line that came to mind is, you know, Jesus says that he doesn't come for the healthy, he comes for the sick. And it's almost as if God doesn't show up where there's finished products. If every community that we're only showcasing finished products, well, then God doesn't show up. God only shows up where there's some unfinished space. Uh, and that requires between more than one person in a fellowship is trying to stumble. And that's when the electricity that surges between people can emerge. But there's a unfinishedness. It's like a circle. It can't be. It has to have yeah. some openness yeah. or God can't come in. That is um, exactly the thing that has been. Especially being involved in these kinds of gatherings for the past six months. And yeah. um, as I, as I, as I keep bringing up, not because I, I'm thinking about it because it won't leave me alone. There's something about the way in which Socrates and the Theotetus talks about how Thales and the Thracian girl, like there, there's, 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 there's this something about, there's this letting of the remembering of concealment as unconcealment when he falls into that well. And then that preserving of the word of the enactment of aporia that happens there within that landscape as is articulated by Socrates when the young Thracian girl says to Thales, you failed to notice what was right before you and under your very feet, which seems to be like the defining articulation of what the human being is eternally in a responding relationship to, that the, the, the moreness and the transcendence in whatever way we want to articulate that is, is it's, it's, it's not even that it's the closeness to us. And it's not even, it's just the very, there's something about that and the, to, to, for our humanity to be able to let ourselves fall into a, an ability to be in a relationship to that, I think in one of the most essential articulations, which is the human being continually, eternally fails to notice what is right before it and under its very feet. And there's something about the beauty of the way in which we archetypally attune ourselves to the event of that kind of occurring. And in all the various ways in which we, in which we identify and articulate that. And, and it's almost like, and then living in relationship to that, I believe is, well, I think is why even within the Theotetus, Socrates, it's like Thales is that because he is one of the seven sages of ancient Greece. There's something about the relationship to that. But then when that, when, 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 when that participatory, like the very, the very telling of that little fable is the participatory realization preceding the propositional holding of that in words. You failed to notice what was right before you and at your very feet. So I think even the very nature of this gathering right now we need to move out of the propositional 
stranglehold that we've had on ourselves in both the history of the West and the history of metaphysics, because the thing that always precedes that is the inceptional event of, of, of being let to remember concealment as unconcealment, but we can't merely stay with the way in which it's unconcealed. We have to always remember that reality is that, 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 that moreness that we're in a relationship with. And then being able to, I suppose, exemplified by Socrates, have that relationship to self, have that relationship to other, and have that relationship to world, where there is that beautiful, as, 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 the, as the translation of Scalé exemplifies, holding oneself in a relationship to that which holds oneself in the first place for free philosophizing. So that, that, that safeguarding and the polis and the gathering and the warding and establishing and the stillness for the saying and the necessity for being, being able to dwell in freedom like that is just, the, 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 because if we don't do that, all of the forms of sophistry and deception and perhaps even if I'm not too arrogant, the word evil comes into place if we don't let ourselves have that kind of relationship to ourselves and each other and the world reality. Now, I've been thinking about that tale a lot since last I heard you tell it. And what comes to mind is like David Hume. And um, it's almost like it's like what Hume would say. It's like uh, you failed to notice while you were looking at your moral theories, you failed to notice that it was the encounter of the face that made you ethical. It wasn't reading Kant, but it was encountering someone. You know, you while you were thinking about your scientific theories of causality, you failed to notice that it was actually seeing the billet balls hit each other that made you believe in causality, not a theory. And so here it makes me think about you were so busy looking for God up in the clouds disembodied that you failed to notice that it was encounter with the world that made God alive to you. And so it's just a repetition of those mistakes uh, that you know, it's not, um, we don't treat our neighbors with love because we read Kant and then we remember, oh, we treat our neighbors and it's in their suchness and encountering them in your, their uniqueness that it naturally compels a certain attitude out of you. Now, reading Kant in the Bible and different things can help. That can create some sort of artic. All philosophy, very often all those things do is articulate something you know into something you understand but you already knew it, maybe the philosophy can help you understand it in a way that you can hold on to it. But there was some encounter with suchness that gave you a knowledge. And, you know, there may be other topics that are different, but it happens all the time. We, uh, we were so busy with our moral theories that we failed to notice it was the encounter of the face that made us moral. We were so busy count, you know, focused on our disembodied God that we failed to notice it's in two or more that the Holy Spirit is gathered, that the Holy Spirit appears. But there has to be faith in the care. I mean, it's the vibration. It's having faith that the care, the concern, the vibration, and being lived by the music that is there. That's the electricity. That it's it's recognizing that that is fragile and requires an emptiness, a silence to hear, to feel, to sense the vibration. And that that's enough. I, I feel I'm not as well familiar with Plato, but didn't he say that he didn't know anything? And um, it's the poem that that vibrates and um, it's very hard I think and very easy to to hear the vibration to hear the music just <clears throat> just 
first of all, I just want to say thank you for, because for me, this is like a, just listening to you and, and noticing what's going on. is just like a deep meditation for me. It's like, and just when you were all speaking before, I just, I just read, I, I noticed, for example, that, that what, right, De Gennaro is, for example, describing what we get from Scolé. And that just suddenly something just fell off me. And then I thought, is this freedom? And I wanted to just, just like ask you right in, the, right in the moment, can you also feel it, this, this freedom that was suddenly there? And then also write how, how time is just now temporalizing in this ecstatic way that's so so different and and, and but kind of like gift giving and and um, giving us this freedom, and then I was also right feeling this this sufficiency just by being seized by this thunderbolt of the electricity of God, and just right right just wanting to dwell in that that holding in this and in this in this realm of scholae in which we are transjectively co-abiding and i'm just right there is this i mean i can't really this is really freedom i think i mean today today when we talk about freedom and so, it's it's like i think when the ancients have talked about freedom in scholae i think they were talking right about something um very different than what we would call today individual rights but it's a relationship to the right it's the right relationship to the polis and then being able to dwell in there and have time have freedom and i think that's that's kind of like that's this leisure that that um, someone like Johannes or Ivo de Gennaro um, are talking about the seizing of the principle in its in its non-appearing, right? That sense of getting closer to what is most determinate of everything yet most sin that most sin that grasping in grass there's a i feel in this particular place so when you said you said about do you all feel it the freedom i think i i think i i think i do um and it's a it's a freedom for freedom with of finding myself free. Um, and that uh, I, I, as we're talking right now, I'm noticing what is most like, what, what's most right here, most intimate is as far as I can understand, I am always finding myself like finding myself already having been in the finding and and this is what i hear in thomas like reaching in some sense reaching to um to hold an integrity and then you used a word safeguard early on thomas and i was like ah safeguard like like i really am glad that the safe is first because if it's guard first and then safety is a product mm -hmm. right if safe is first and guarding guarding is a response right to it it's a reverence or awareness of that um and sometimes i feel less personally i feel less less dominated 
<laughs> by the, the cultural, the cultural, what do we call it? The cultural um, godding <laughs> of trauma. Hmm. And your unquestioned proclamations of protection of, of something, that safeguard, safe first, it's already here. Yeah, that, that, that invitational quality, I really, I really appreciated that. I'd never, it, it's a wonderful, just, I, that, that, it's one of the most magical things about language, just the very facts of language that is just like you could hear a word in a way you've never been able to hear a word before. And then that just, but I love, and, and, and when you said that, it, it just, just my, 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 my sitting with Parmenides like every single day, there's something about just, then even in that silent stillness, there's something about, there, there, there's an invitational quality in order for you to be able to dwell with them. But it's not, but, the, 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 but that, that guarding quality is they're not going to, they're not going to force you to come into that domain because then it can just so easily become the place that is unfree and closed off. And so there's something about that that's so beautiful about that safeguarding. And then that's even that thing, I think, OG, you brought up that thing about Christ. Christ only heals those who want to be healed. There's something already about them them seeking, you know, it's just like, as he is this incarnated form of the principality of logos, he is the thing that which is followed. So whenever you allow yourself perhaps to, to seek it or to be received by it, it was there the whole time, even though we were failing to notice it. But there's that beautiful thing about that, that, that safeguarding, but to, to imagine it even with someone who in a silent stillness exemplifies freedom in that they are not it's just that 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 is that, that 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 quality where like even with parmenides where he's literally dwelling in the abode of aletheia where the only trustworthy way is to say that being is even though he's familiar with all of the, the paths of mortals so he's still in the common crowd but he's he's that thing that's able to see truth through all illusion there's something there's something about that 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 he, he's not going to force you to come to where he dwells, but if, but, but he, I suppose there's always that inviting nature into the reality of even what Socrates affords with the aporia into that no placeness for then for you to say with clarity, what is, and then you home that place as yet another way of knowledge or another way of access to the way out. And then philosophical knowledge is, you know, all of the past attempts of, affording kinds of access but then the thing that we're trying to do here with this practicing and this establishing of this kind of relating is we're not trying to be we're not trying to to articulate or, or remember or memorize or you know monologically war with one another over philosophical knowledge but we're actually trying to be philosophical in our relationship to ourselves towards each other and that to which we are sharing and are responding to no, Tom, it, it would be very interesting. Um, generally in the New Testament, um, when people come to Jesus, he has a lot to say. But when Jesus is taken to people like Pilate, he has very little to say. So there's a structure in the narrative of the movement. And so likewise, I've been thinking a lot lately on the difference between explaining and addressing. And I've been thinking about how often we go to explain truth, or being or what have you, instead of being addressed by being and we need to move to a state where we're letting truth address us as opposed to explaining it now yeah. there's something to be said maybe um to go back to my obsession with david mm -hmm. hume there is a degree where we need explanation to get to the place where truth can address us but we must be ready to make that uh, uh, that switch that adjustment when it's time and very often so much of our troubles in life are a result of not pivoting at the right moment or not pivoting when we should, like, you know, maybe thinking has gotten us here and now we need to move to perception or more wisdom. But since thinking, all the evidence shows that thinking has worked great up to this point. So it's faith to make the pivot. 
and we haven't really used faith. So we have reason not to think we need to use it. So we don't make these pivots. And I think they're also, it's like when you have kids, you have to pivot in your expectations of being able to say at two in the morning, go to IHOP, right? Because your kids are in the house. You can't just do it. You have to pivot. And if you don't pivot, your expectations won't match reality. you will have error. And the last thing I was going to say, because I think what Fiverr is saying on faith is very important. Um, if I have this pen in my hand and I'm holding it, um, there's two ways I could engage in thinking. I can uh, start to go, well, how do I know the pen's going to stay there? And then I clutch it to make sure because I'm thinking, or someone comes along and says, hey, how do you know the pen's going to stay in your hand? And I say, oh, because I have faith in it. I'm trusting, I'm holding it well. And I use thinking to divert attacks on the holding as opposed to assure the holding. Regarding the holding of the pen, I have faith and I'm using thinking to defend the holding of the faith. All of the mistakes happen when we use thinking when we should have faith and then we clutch, uh, or we try to just have faith and we don't think and then the world comes and takes our pen because we didn't have the thinking to defend it. And so likewise, what Daniel's saying about freedom, freedom is this, it's the metaphor of the bird that my wife came up with, I use all the time, holding the bird in your hand open as opposed to clutching its feet. This is freedom, but it's so, you were saying, Daniel, is freedom a thought as a, a feeling as opposed to a proposition? Yeah, it's more of a feeling because the moment it's a thought, freedom is gone because you clutched it <laughs> because now you're pro it's a proposition. So the great irony is the moment you think about freedom, which you should approach by faith, is the very moment when it's gone, which then functions as evidence to you it was never there. And so then you say, oh, well, that moment I thought I was free must not have been. And so there's a reaching back where you self and you lose it and it slips away. But once you get the right order of faith and thinking, well, then you can stay in that space. Mm, I love inherent is the dance in that. Yes. Thinking of God as a dance is one of the great accomplishments of C.S. Lewis. You know, I'm always going to Chris because I did so much work in Chris. You know, in the space trilogy, God is a dance. Each, but it's the, you know, you, the experience of God is to see three people dancing. And the metaphor of dancing is so critical for fellowship. My wife was a dancer because there's a multiplicity, but a oneness of which is only nonsense outside of it. It is uh, the, the problem of the one in the many is often easily solved in doing it. It's outside of it that it's like a contradictory mess. But when you enter the one in the many, it's not a, it's not a contradiction at all. It's just the philosophical problem of it's the obvious. one in the... Yes, it's obvious. So that philosophical, but many in my, a lot of the work I do, I believe a lot of philosophical problems actually are solved by going into them. It is only when you think about them that they can't be solved, but they are answered with a do, they are answered in the doing. Yeah. So if we say the thinking about, right? What is that thinking about? What is addressing that thinking about? What is it that, what is that, 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 thinking about is responding to well should should it be surprising to us that we have to bring it forth again and again and again and again and that we will never know it that it's a constant unfolding what did we expect what is the expectation that we will read something and know it. Why should it surprise us that this logos, the poem, the image, whatever it is, the soul has to be constantly recreated in hmm. and and re renewed and built upon, you never stand in the same water river twice or whatever they say, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, kind of like, what did we expect? Mm -hmm. No, that makes me think of the end of Among School Children by Yeats, that famous line where he says, can we know the dance separate from the dancer? Well, obviously we can't. Um, you have to be dancing for the dance to be there. And yet it's as if thinking is completely bent, heck bent even, <laughs> you know, on creating a world where dancing occurs without us having to do any 
dancing, where the dance is there independent of dancers. Thinking is the contradict. Thinking actually is where you get the, po- the paradoxes and the contradictions. We think it's in the meditative perception and all this stuff that happens. But, but that's the space of entering into the doing where the paradox, the apparent, I call them apparent contradictions, turn out not to be negations at all. The one in the many absolutely occurs when you're in it. And so likewise, thinking pure thinking sets us up to try to achieve a world, just like you're saying, Fiverr, where we expect there to be dance without dancers, without doing the work of dancing, which makes no sense when you look at it clearly and straightforward like that. But thinking has a whole lot of tricks, cognitive biases, you know, anti-mental models, if you will, and different things to make us believe that's possible. And if we never take the time to be still and realize it's not possible, such as in a space with this, you can easily go through our whole life after that impossible goal of thinking without ever realizing it's not possible. The dance is never the same one either. The, exactly. The, the terrain is always different. Mm-hmm. There are different problems. And so each time it's recreated. I love that question. What did we expect? Yeah, what did we expect? What do I, well, what do I love, if I ever, what do I love about that question? Why do I love that question? Do you even know? Because it's, I mean, I don't know. For me, it sort of um, brings me back to wonder and it, I, it seems to me that I'm awfully presumptuous. I have all these expectations because I read some book. And then you look out at the world, you look ah. out at the park, and you sort of say, man, when you really look at all this mm. and the wonder of it, anything's possible. Even the creation myths from (laughs) the wildest ones, Mm. who is to say they're not true? Because what you're seeing outside your window is so freaking amazing Mm -hmm. that, you know, but then there's something about what, about the working it through that, um, that brings us together, doesn't it? I mean, it trying to understand together. And um, I don't know, I guess that's the electricity, isn't it? Daniel. Yeah. Daniel. I feel like Daniel is like holding so much of the energy in this circle. And I just feel an an enormous amount of gratitude and Mm -hmm. absolutely. Or that. No, I, I think what's you made that very wonderful point on how the dance has to be different every time. And one of the ways I think you do get struck by the wonder of looking out your window is you just see how different it is that the light on Monday at 2 a.m., you know, on 2 p.m. is hitting the flower differently than at five. You know, I worked as a photographer for a long time and I always struck by how the same location under different lighting is so radically different in time of year and all of these different factors. That was always amazing to me and it was always um, different. One of the things that I think has hurt us is we associate consistency and repetition with truth. That a thing that repeats is actual and difference is chaos and not actual. And I think that comes a little bit from the, the um, get into capitalism, um, get into the industrial revolution where there's this sameness. So you get reliable productivity. The things that's interesting is that the things that are constant are actually total abstractions like Monday. There is no Monday. 
but it's another Monday. Oh, it's another weekend. Oh, it's another day at the job. You know, actually, if you think about it, like we live in a world of consistency, but all of those consistencies are abstractions. And yet they gradually become reality. And the, the complete suchness fact that that flower outside your window at every moment of the day uh, presents itself under a different lighting and with a different suchness is lost behind the idea that it's Monday again. Oh, it's Monday again. Oh, I got to go to work again. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got to pay the bills again. Well, bills only exist because humans made them. You know, I've got to do clean the house again. Well, houses are there because we've made them. So many of the things that are the consistencies in our lives are conventions. They are things we have made. That doesn't mean they're necessarily bad, but they have a way of gradually hijacking our ability to appreciate the fundamental reality of, um, of difference, of profound um, difference that that is not difference in a chaotic way, but precisely why there's beauty. If you have a, yeah, I think I said it with Guy the other day. If a rainbow was literally one color, it wouldn't be very pretty. Uh, if it was just red or it was just green or something, it would be kind of weird. It's precisely because there's a multiplicity of difference that come together that make it beautiful. So we have to see through Monday, see through it's two o'clock again, see through it's dinner again, see through these things to get at that uh that beautiful difference and then to have faith in them the, through our natural um tendency of thinking to be a to be our thinking seems attracted to repetition thinking seems like it likes the repetition and the stable so we have to so if we think about what i'm saying generally then you're going to err on the side of <laughs> the non-existent conventions because that's what thinking's oriented to so you have to have faith through that um in per se the flower outside the window that changes in its color based on the time of day. Yeah, because we're not something permanent. We are an idea. Uh, we are not a, essential in a sense. Right. We are, oh yeah. And so it makes sense that we have to bring this forth reveal be constantly revealing it, it's i don't think that we have any choice in the matter yeah what did we expect yeah that's so good that's so great what? daniel yeah. keeps daniel keeps going to saying something and then he realizes all he's been hearing is the space between words No, you know, I was I was thinking about right. We, we were talking about thinking, and I think all of you, you you were kind of like dancing around what I was what I was wanting to say. Um. So, right, one of the oldest fragments of our of Western philosophies for being and thinking are the same from Parmenides. Yeah. But right, that doesn't mean right that. It, with that that we are thinking creatures there comes a certain responsibility because by our thinking right we can we can shape reality we can shape the intelligibility of the world and it can take on many forms right but that was this is what, what heidegger was talking about in the contributions all the time this shock because today our thinking has become so kind of like instrumentalized, kind of, right? When we talk about instrumental rationality and these things, that then, that then this this sense, this, so this this domain of sense turns and withdraws, and we just right, we just see objects and and matter, and nothing has any sense anymore. But just when when Fiverr was speaking, I was I was reminded of this quote from Nishitani where he says. It's, it's actually from Basho, from this 17th century Japanese poet. Um, from the pine tree, learn the koto of the pine tree. And from the bamboo, learn the koto of the bamboo. And then I thought, from Fiverr, learn the koto of the fiver. And from mm -hmm. Daniel, learn the koto of Daniel. And from Thomas, learn the koto of Thomas. And from Guy, learn the koto of Guy. 
perhaps you know this, but in, in, the, in the dialogue with a Japanese scholar, Heidegger calls Koto from Kotoba, the happening of the lightning message of the graciousness that brings forth. And so what, what Nishitani is saying then, right? The identity of being and thinking is even deeper than we have thought because what we are doing with our thinking is that we, um, we are also kind of like um, bringing each being into its into its its home ground where it then ha has this self standing hold what he calls samadhi and so so that's i think why the human being is also right it's the shepherd or the midwife of being and that's also why we we need a kind of like a religious attitude towards the intelligibility of the world so when so mm. when i read when i when i read this sentence now for being and thinking are the same right and this this also means that our thinking right we, we need this kind of religious attitude because right god is in this in this in between of being and thinking god is always the surging electricity between us and as we were reminded by the slow reading of this passage from buber from guy we are not right we we have to be very careful not to turn all of this into an it but we have to dow the world. We have to we have to recognize and be right. Be be have reverence towards the I Dao relationship, which includes all beings. Yes. Yeah. And I I would imagine, and I I think I have a I have a heartbeat for this for this possibility that every single perception can say that. Like everything could just say that. All right. This seems like a, um, a very good beginning. So wonderful being with you all. Wonderful being with all y'all. It's been wonderful. Yeah. So, let's do a round of just checkouts start with uh start with daniel daniel z. daniel z yeah i think i just said everything what i wanted to say yeah, really I, i'm just i'm 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 very happy that we were able to meet together yes oh gee Yeah, you know, as you were saying all that, I was just reflecting on the necessity of the perpetuation of practices, the con of doing these practices a lot, because even the idea that thought can be instrumental and is bad can itself become a thought in service of instrumental rationality if you use it to think that you're not doing it. So likewise, what we read from Buber, if it doesn't lead to a practice, you can assume that you're because you're having small talk maybe with someone at the grocery store that you'll have that electricity with God and won't notice that you're actually are going to that deeper level. So it's always, I think it just, you can't ever get away from the practicing because you can talk all day long about the shortcomings of thought and the need to have engagement with the world, but without the practices, those themselves just become in service of um, disembodied living. Thomas. I'm kind of, I'm still left with really loving what Fiverr said about what were we expecting? Yeah, that was wonderful. And, and in that, and in that, even just that, 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 that I love, then I was just like Fiverr and the Thracian girl were standing side by side as they let these stupid mortals fall. Cause in that, in that just simple, what were we expecting and what was the expectation that we all, that already has us pre pre sent towards a kind of expecting already moving us away from the kind of realizing continually eternally enacting something. It's just like, what, or what is the expectation that the various inception, inceptionalizing of tradition already sends us upon a particular way of being pre sent in our expectings of the ways in which ourselves and the world should be without ever actually just having that, you know, something, something, something about that, um, 
something about already showing up here present towards something without actually being able to realize the eternity that is that just is that we yeah something just really beautiful about that just simple saying yeah fiber so i guess i signed up for this and i did not know what to expect (laughs) me too me too too. (laughs) but it was wonderful and yeah very very special and thank you very much for including me so generously thank you for being here with us Mm -hmm. yes yes so actually this is the first so five this is fiber no user this is your first philosophical fellowship practice oh yes congratulations i'm so glad that i didn't think to prepare you for it (laughs) yay (laughs) Oh, this is really great. This is really awesome. Um, and uh, I feel like you, you, all of you, uh, all of you evoked something, you invoked it, and you left, you left me more present to the whole of the donut, but with a W. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just love you guys. Oh, love you too. We'll it was more. a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank we'll all of y'all. It was wonderful. Really wonderful.